If you would open your scripture with me to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, we'll be reading verses 13 through 17. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we have already declared this morning through song, you are indeed our strength, our rock, our fortress, our deliverer. Lord, we are grateful that when we find ourselves wounded by the world, uh, Lord, wounded by our own sin, that far from, far from casting us aside, you welcome us into your presence that you might deliver us and make us whole. Lord, we gather here this morning as a people who, Lord, have experienced all manner of heartaches, all, all manner of troubles and trials, We thank you that we can find rest for our weary souls in your presence. Lord, we pray as we come and we we find rest and peace in you that we would remember that, that, Lord, you bring healing in our lives just not to, not only to to make us whole, but, Lord, to, to then invite us to be a part of your mission to take that healing to the whole world. So, Lord, we pray today as we study your word once again that the words of my mouth the meditation of each of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What a powerful word and song this morning already. It's so good to be here uh, with you, our brothers and sisters in Christ, to be led in such powerful worship. We find, we find really our place when we enter the presence of God through worship. It's so good to visit with you. I have several of you I was visiting this morning. The same question keeps coming up over and over again. Are you and your family getting settled? Uh, I heard one person put it this way. We are settled like an old bag of potato chips. I mean, we, we are getting settled. We're down. The, you'll get that one in a little bit. I know. We, we're settled. Boxes are unpacked. Uh, the, the, both cars are in the garage. We are, loving, we are loving and making this our home. I even got my car air conditioned fixed this week so I can truly be at home here in Sugar Land, Texas. You spend a lot of time in your car, and I've learned no matter how much they say it costs to fix the air conditioner, that is an investment you want to make. Part of getting settled here in Sugarland is adapting to really new things, whether it be the humidity and the heat. We had heat in West Texas, but the humidity is something new. It's also that I'm, I'm starting to see all sorts of new warning signs that I, I didn't need in San Angelo. You'll learn this about me soon enough. Uh, if somebody gives a warning, I'm a play it safe kind of guy. I'm a firstborn rule follower. Somebody says to watch out for something, I'm going to be watching out for that. And so here I've got new signs. I've noticed a sign on on uh, Highway 69 out there that just announces for all to see how many people who have died on that stretch of highway. Uh, You know, we didn't have that in San Angelo. There there weren't a lot of highways, and you saw more cows than people on those highways. But but here I'm thinking, and I keep, you know, it's hands-free, so I haven't figured out how to take a picture, but I got to see how fast that's going up. That, That number's concerning me. And so, I'm trying to figure out how to avoid that stretch of road, and I haven't quite figured that out. There are also billboards that announce to me to be on the lookout for the Zika virus. It's carried by mosquitoes, and so there's all sorts of warnings about wearing long sleeves and long pants, which I don't know how you do that with the humidity, but I'm trying. When I was mowing my yard this week, if you happened to drive by, you would have seen me in long pants and a long shirt and a big old hat to protect against the sun, and I want you to know I still had five mosquito bites by the time I finished. You know, I've even got the Skeeter's baseball cap just to say to the mosquitoes, I am on your side. <laughs> and they still are, 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 you know, haven't picked up. On, I have goodwill towards them. 
But anytime you move somewhere, there are new dangers. And, and we're just wired. God wired us in some ways to pay attention to the dangers in the world. In fact, he wired us this way because we just think when we didn't live in nice air-conditioned homes with, with, with you know, security systems and, and we were asleep out in the middle of nowhere, you know, you had to be on high alert. If you, if you heard a noise outside, you had to wake up because it could be a bear, you know. You, you had to be ready. But we are wired in that way so that when we see danger, our lives are just, we're just, we're hotwired to pay attention and to be fearful. And, and, and we live in a world where this becomes overwhelming for us. Because not only do we have the signs on the highway, we have a 24-hour news cycle that if you pay attention is doing what? Telling you all the time about new dangers that there are in the world. Because now we don't just pay attention to the dangers that are right in our neighborhood, do we? It's not just the signs on the billboard, but we hear about dangers from all over the world. Now I'm connected to several communities in the world. Of course, I grew up in Texarkana. We lived in San Angelo for a long time. Now we're here in Sugar Land. And, and on Facebook, I follow all of those different news sources. And so this this week, I got to hear about a, a, a murder in Texarkana and an accident in San Angelo. And then right here in Sugar Land, we have troubles of our own. And I don't know about you, but me, I find myself at the end of almost every day just thinking, this is a dangerous world. And it's not just the physical dangers, is it? We live in a world that's filled with spiritual dangers as well. I don't believe that there are really a whole lot of new sins, but there do seem to, do seem to be some new ways of getting at old sins, don't there? But with the advent of technology, we, we have in our hands access to, to, to good ideas from all over the world, but we also have access in our hands to what? Terrible ideas from all over the world. The dangers seem all around us, and we find ourselves asking, what is a person to do? And as the church, church in this place, we also find ourselves asking, what is the church to do? What is our response to be to all of the danger in the world? Well, Tom Monaghan, uh, the founder of Domino's Pizza, how many have ever eaten a Domino's Pizza? Yep, that, that, you've helped this man because he is spending $400 million of his own money to build a community from scratch. He looked at the world just like you and I look at it. He sees all the dangers in the world, and he said, I don't want to live in those dangerous places anymore. And so he is building a, a place in Florida. In fact, he's been working on it for quite a while. He, he's a, a practicing Catholic. It's called Ave Maria, Florida. How's that for a name of a city? And, and he's building this community from scratch, a lot like the planned communities in here, but it is specifically meant to be a Catholic uh, town. And so I, I don't think you have to be Catholic to live there, but the, the cathedral is the center of the town. And, and Things are organized in such a way that, that everything focuses around life uh, there at the cathedral. Uh, it's a place where he hopes that he can limit uh, things like pornography and because he's Catholic birth control and certainly other uh, evil things like drugs. His vision is for a religious community in an increasingly secular world. It's a vision I think at least some of us can find appealing. And his vision has proved very, very popular. In fact, it has consistently been listed over the last few years as the fastest growing planned community in the United States. People look at our dangerous world and this idea of finding some kind of community where you could move to to escape all of the troubles in the world. I won't ask for a show of hands, but who does that sound appealing to? We'd love to find a place where we could go to and maybe isolate ourselves from the troubles of this world. Christians really have been trying to do that for years. I finished a book this summer by Rob Dre uh, Dreher. I think that's how you say his name. Uh, it's, 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 one of the, it's been one of the most popular books over the last few months called The Benedict Option. Maybe some of you have read it. And he's aware of all of the, the changes in our culture the, 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 that threaten what it mean, looks like to practice our faith. And, and he talks about what Christians may need to do in order to keep living their faith in the world around us. And, and his solution comes from some of the, the ancient monks where they withdrew from society at large in order to have these communities where they could live in relative safety from the dangers of the world around them. I think there's probably partial truth to that. It's true that the church is to be a place where people can gather and at least for a little while take refuge from the danger of the world, where we can gather with like-minded people to study God's Word and to see what it teaches. There is an aspect of that in our faith, isn't it? 
We sing that powerful song just now. It comes from perhaps one of the Psalms, Psalm 18, that says, the Lord is our rock and our fortress. He is our deliverer. In him we take refuge. There is this idea that you and I, we gather in this place with God's people to find refuge in God's presence. There's something true to that. But also we have the testimony of Jesus, don't we? That if God is our refuge, it is not just so that we can spend our li- the rest of our lives in a holy huddle, but it is so that we can find healing in his midst and then join him in his mission of doing what? Bringing that healing to the rest of the world. What do we find ourselves so often doing? I'm right there with you. We find ourselves coming to God for refuge and we feel safe from the storms of the world. And then what do we find ourselves doing? I think I want to stay right here. We know what it's like out there. It's filled with dangers and troubles and heartaches. And we think, let's find a safe place and stay there. But then what do we have? We have the example of our Savior who lived where? In the heavens with God the Father. Talk about a safe place. Talk about a gated community. You got one there, right? That's where Jesus has dwelled for all eternity in great safety. And yet what has he done? He has left the safety of heaven to join us here on earth. And not just here on earth in the relatively safe places, but he has gone to the darkest corners of this earth, right to the tax collectors to have supper with them. Because he says what? I have come not for the righteous, but to call sinners. This is the picture we get in this passage because Jesus is challenging what he knows is a temptation for all of us to live our lives in the safety of the fortress we call church. Fourth, faith as a fortress was really the mistake of the Pharisees, wasn't it? The Pharisees thought Jesus was the one making the mistake in this passage. They couldn't ha- understand how a teacher of the law, and that's who they thought of Jesus at this point in the story. They couldn't understand how the, a teacher of the law would be having dinner of all things with a tax collector. We talked a few weeks ago about how in the ancient world, you really only broke bread with those people that you could claim to be a sharing uh, life with, the people who you agreed with, people who, who were a part of, of your group, especially for the Jew. It wasn't just that they weren't supposed to eat supper with bad people. It's, it's the very shape of their religion was such that if you wanted to participate in worship, if you wanted to go to the temple, you couldn't have supper with a Gentile. You couldn't have supper with someone who was even sick, even through no fault of their own. If they were sick and you you wanted to go worship that week, you had to keep them at arm's length. You certainly, certainly couldn't have supper with someone like a tax collector whose total way of living was unclean. To eat with them would not only have tarnished your reputation, it would have prevented you from going to worship that week. Can you imagine out there if we had not just our ushers at the door to hand you a bulletin, but we had ushers at the door that said, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Did you eat this week with an unchurched person? Well, I said, well, yeah, I mean, I go to work, and they're in the, the, the office, you know, break room. I, I could, if I wanted to eat, I had to eat with sinners. You don't know the people I work with. They qualify. They're there, you know. And we say, well, you know, I'm sorry. You can't come in this week. Maybe next week. Maybe get things cleaned up and we'll see in a week or two. That, that was really the way worship took place in there. You, you, worship was a place where you could only come and participate. One, if you were a Jew, you had to be a Jew. And two, you had to be a male. And, and anyone who didn't qualify that couldn't come to the inner parts of the temple to, to worship or the inner courts. But also with that, if you happened to fit that category, you were male and a faithful Jew. If you were in any way unclean that week or touched anyone unclean or spent any time with anyone unclean, you could not worship worship. And the goal there was an honorable goal, right? It's because it was a recognition of God's holiness. It was a recognition of, of God's purity. And, and this idea was if we were going to come into the presence of a holy God and worshiped him, we needed to make sure that we were pure. The only trouble with that, of course, is how many people can actually make it into the presence of God under such regulations? If we're honest about who we are, Not a one of us. For what does the scriptures teach? Not one of us is righteous. But the Pharisees, they were the people who were trying to live up to that. We, the Pharisees get a bad rap. If if, if you've grown up in Christian churches and you read the New Testament, we just think of the Pharisees as this, this 
people who are scowling and they're mean. I mean, they're the people who are yelling at you for, you know, smiling too much. That's not who the Pharisees were. The Pharisees were actually reformers. The Sadducees were kind of the elite Jews. They were the ones who thought, you know, it was only for a couple of people to participate in the life of the worship uh, of Judaism. But the Pharisees were actually trying to bring, in many ways, uh, the faith of Israel to the people. These were not people who hid themselves in the temple. They wanted to practice the Torah, the law, in day-to-day living. They wanted to do this in ways that honored God. They wanted to help people do this, but they also thought that they did this by becoming really super religious people. And they did this by by going out of their way to keep from bumping into sinners. They wanted a large group of people to be following Jesus and to be pure. I mean, not Jesus, but following God and to be pure, but they thought that the way to accomplish that was to keep sinners at arm's length. In fact, there were a group of Pharisees called the black and blue Pharisees. I like this. They were so afraid that they might accidentally look at a woman and and lust that they would walk around town with their eyes closed. So you know how they got their nickname, the black and blue Pharisees? If you walk around with your eyes closed, you run into things. They were the black and blue Pharisees. But, But they lived this way. And so they actually liked Jesus. Sometimes we read in the story, we read just at the end of the story where the Pharisees become essentially the the opposition party to Jesus and his disciples. But early on, they actually thought Jesus might be the one. They loved some of the things that Jesus taught about. Jesus taught about the kingdom of God being at hand. That's what the Pharisees were about. The Pharisees thought if we could just get our act together, then God's kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. That's what they wanted, and they heard Jesus preaching about that. They heard Jesus preaching about righteousness, about holiness. What did Jesus say? You need to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. They heard him teaching about these things, and they were like, he sounds like one of us. And so you have Pharisees like Nicodemus and others who are actually listening to Jesus, and they want to see as if he might be the one until you get stories like our story today where he goes and he eats with a sinner like Levi. It just doesn't fit their pattern. They couldn't understand how Jesus could preach about being perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect and at the same time go and dine with someone like Levi, a tax collector. Tax collectors weren't just people who worked for the IRS. None of us necessarily like paying taxes, but this is more than that. Tax collectors were Jewish men who who really had, had betrayed their nation and gone to work for Rome. And in working for Rome, they were going to collect the taxes for for Caesar. That was onerous enough to the Jews because they felt, uh, rightly so, as if Caesar was an occupying force. It wasn't like they had an elected government with representatives they were paying taxes to. This was a a tyrant lording over them. And so here you had Jews working for the tyrant, but it was more than that. Uh, These tended just to be dishonest people. And so the way they they made their own money is they would go collect the taxes for Caesar, and, and, and they were just allowed to tack on anything else they wanted to raise. And so they had to pay Caesar what he was asking for. But if they wanted to raise a little bit more money for their own pockets, well, they had a few Roman soldiers beside them to help them do that. So you can imagine, these are your neighbors, these are your kinsmen, these are your family members, and yet they have gone to work for the tyrant. And not only that, they're using the power of the tyrant to enrich themselves. These are people who were disliked by everyone. And yet Jesus not only goes to eat with one of them, invites this man named Levi to be a part of his disciples. Gives him the same invitation he gives to the others. Come and follow me. Can you imagine that? I mean, the reputation that Jesus must have, have, have had as a teacher, but then to squander that reputation on someone like Levi. I want you to know, when I came as your pastor and the search committee was interviewing me, part of that process was a background check and a credit check. Because we live in a world where we've got to check all those things right now. But Jesus did not do that on Levi. If he had done that, Levi would not have passed the background check. He would have failed miserably. And so the Pharisees are looking at this and they're thinking, why would you do this? This is not what a teacher of righteousness does. And yet Jesus hears them, and he asks them, and he says to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not to come the righteous, but sinners. The Pharisees looked at the world, and here's what they saw. Sin is contagious. It's what we see, too. I see that. I talk to my kids all the time about this. I I mean, the apostle, I quote the apostle Paul from Corinthians, bad company corrupts what? Good character. 
I teach this to my children. It's in the Bible. But like so many things in the Bible, we have to take it in the whole picture, right? And if we only think in that way, we fall to the trap of the Pharisees. We constantly have to remember the message of Jesus. It's not just sin that's contagious, but also righteousness. That's what Jesus believed, that Jesus came, and and obviously he's in a different category than we are. He is the perfect son of God, but he was not afraid of catching our sin. What he longed for was for us to catch his righteousness. And he knew in order for that to happen, he would have to spend time among us. He came to seek and save the Levi's of the world. In many ways, he picks the Levi's of the world because he knows that unless we can believe that the Levi's of the world can be saved, we will not believe that the gospel is for the worst of us, and it's for all of us. Levi is the one who can say, he can point to Levi and say, this gospel is for every lost soul. It's for Levi, and it's for you too. We talked a while back about how, you know, I was the example at A&M. I lived in the athletic dorm when they weren't allowed to have an athletic dorm, uh, but they really still had an athletic dorm, but they let just a few people like me live there so they could point to people like me and say, see, this isn't an athletic dorm. (laughs) And I think that's a little bit what's happening here. But Jesus came, and, and his mission, friends, his mission was to seek and save the lost, which meant to go out and recruit his followers from amongst the, the Pharisees would have, would, have, would have misled people because people would have led, thought, well, Jesus has come to seek and save those that are really looking hard to find God. Jesus has come to seek and save those who are really trying to be as good as they can possibly be. Instead, Jesus came and called people like Levi so that his message would be clear, I have come to seek and save the lost. And he gives this glorious example of a physician. Who does a physician treat? Just those who are well? No, we get that you have annual checkups, but the, the physician treats those who are sick. We expect our doctors to do that. Could you imagine making a phone call this week to your doctor's office and saying, I'm not feeling good. I, I really need to come in for an appointment. And they say to you, well, you have, been, have you been running a fever? You say, yes, 102, 103. One day it even got up to 104. And the nurse on the other end says, well, that, that's pretty bad. Uh, uh, you know, are you experiencing any pain? You said, yes, I'm experiencing excruciating pain. I mean, my, my stomach is just constantly turned over. Well, have you experienced any nausea or, or vomiting? Uh, yes, all the time. And then the nurse, very alarmed, says, you really do sound sick. And you say, that, I am. When can I have an appointment? She says, I'm not sure we want to see you right now. You sound really contagious. You know, wait till you're feeling a little better and then give us a call and we'll see what we can do. If we had a doctor like that, what would we do? We would find another doctor because the purpose of a doctor is to do what? To help bring healing into the lives of those who are sick. Jesus in this passage and many others has made his purpose clear. He hasn't come to help those who have already cleaned up their act. Jesus has come to seek and save the lost. He is the great physician. And we experience that. And when we sing songs about him being our refuge, when we sing songs about him being our deliverer, when we sing songs about him being our fortress, what we are saying is we have found healing in the Savior's presence. We are to sing about that, and we are to give God thanks about that, but we are never to forget that that healing and that deliverance is not, it's not just for us. It's not just for those who've already found their way into Christ's presence. This is Christ's mission into the world until he comes again. And if we are his people, if we are the church, guess what? It is our mission too. Which means we're really less like a fortress. In fact, fortress is really a bad picture for the church. We're less like a fortress and we are more like an emergency room, or maybe like a field hospital, a place that exists in the world in order to bring healing and help to those in need. When I was in seminary, 
you know, again, rule follower, you know, Alice and I, when we dated in college, just to give you a picture of who we are, I've already told you, you know, my great rebellion was going to a Billy Graham crusade without telling my mother that I did that. Uh, it was in another town. But, but also, you know, Alice and I were in college together, and we were very active in our church. And, you know, you're in college. Nobody's giving you a curfew. But, but we were just kind of the kids who were like, well, you know, we got church tomorrow. We, we got to get in bed pretty early tonight. You know, it's, we were those kind of kids. And, and, and yet, uh, still in tr- it, there, it, you know, in that day, we were people who always played it safe. But then I get to seminary, and I take an urban missions class, okay? Now, I grew up in Texarkana, not super urban. Uh, then I was in College Station, not super urban. Waco, though not a huge town, has some urban problems. And so we had this urban missions class. And one of the assignments for the play it safe kind of guy like me uh, was to do a police ride-along one night. That was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it really wasn't as fun as it could have been. Mainly, we just broke up Baylor parties all night long. Uh, <laughs> those good Baptist kids, right? And, and then the other, one of the other assignments was that I had to spend a Friday or Saturday evening all night long in uh, the emergency room. And I just had to sit there and take notes on what I saw. Now, I just want you to know, even if you call me now, you, if you have a crisis, you can call me. But if it's after 10 o'clock, you're going to wake me up. I'm that kind of guy. I go to bed early. And here the assignment is stay up all night long at an emergency room, an urban emergency room on a Friday or Saturday night. So I go, you know, I'm looking really good. I got my little, my little notebook. And I, I, I'm surprised somebody didn't come ask me what I was doing, you know. And I'm sitting there and I'm just watching. And, and it was amazing. Do you know just because you are asleep doesn't mean the world's not hurting? All night long, broken people and broken families, people at their wits' end, poured into that emergency room doing what? Looking for help. That is the picture of the church or at least it should be. We know the dangers out there, don't we? We live in a dangerous world. Not just the dangers of Zika and all those things, but the dangers of of sin and the troubles that it causes. And, And I want you to know we should not be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised that our neighbors are heartbroken and hurting and sick and looking for healing. And the question is, Is our church a fortress or an emergency room? I've actually known churches that were built like fortresses. Went to visit a church one time. I couldn't even figure out how to get inside because they had the great big wooden doors that just looked locked all the time. That's not the picture, is it? We want to be a, a, not just a building, but more than that, a people who say you're hurting. Come on in. This is where you need to be. But to do that, guess what? We have to risk getting close to those who are are at their wit's end. And I want you to know it's going to feel dangerous because we do know the dangers, don't we? That if we interact with those who are hurting, if we interact with those who are sinful, we know bad company can corrupt good character. So we we don't do this naively. We don't do this without precautions. But but we also understand we follow a Savior who does, does what? Who goes and touches those who are hurting. One of my favorite books is uh, a book by, called uh, Soul Survivor. It's by Philip Yancey, one of my favorite authors. And in Soul Survivor, he really talks about all of his heroes of the faith who have helped him, uh, you know, stick with Jesus. Let's just be honest. Following Jesus is not always easy, is it? And sometimes we need good examples who can help us persevere in the faith. And so this book, A Soul Survival, is really all of those heroes of the faith who have helped Philip Yancey persevere in his walk with Jesus. And one of those is the late Dr. Paul Brand. In fact, early in his career, uh, Philip Yancey co-authored a couple of books with Dr. Brand, and, and, and they're wonderful little books. One, You Are Fearfully Made and Wonderfully Made. And, and another, uh, I'm going to forget the title right here, is The Gift of Pain. And, and that really comes from the heart of Dr. Brand's ministry. He was a surgeon, well-known surgeon, who, who went to India in order to work with lepers. And this was years and years ago uh, when that disease still carried quite a, quite a, uh, you know, a, a reputation uh, for staying away, especially in India at that time. And so Philip Yancey wanted to see this work, and he goes with Dr. Brand uh, there to India to to minister to some of those, and he meets a man named uh, Sadan, S-A-D-A-N. 
And, and Sutton begins to tell his story. He, he contracted uh, the disease of, of leprosy in, in, in India at that time. That meant immediate ostracization from uh, all of your family. His family kicked him out. Uh, he, he really could find nowhere to live. He even went to a hospital and they said this to him, we do not treat lepers here. He didn't know what to do until one day he heard about Dr. Brand and he made his way to Dr. Brand's clinic and he says, far from turning me away, Dr. Brand welcomed me in, not just to his hospital, but to his home. Invited him over to eat. And there they sat at the table together and when it finally came time to, to care for him, he says, Dr. Brand took my feet, my bloody feet in his hands. He said, it had been decades since anyone had touched me. I had almost forgotten what human touch felt like. And he said, in Dr. Brand, I found not only healing for my body, but healing for my soul. He went to another patient's house who there on his wall captured really the spirit of all those that Dr. Brand had treated. It was a photo of Dr. Brand. Can you imagine that? They go into this man's home, and there on the wall, he has a picture of his doctor. And there beneath it were these words, may the spirit that is in him live in me. Friends, it's true that sin is contagious, and we do need to be careful in the world. But let us never forget the greater truth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The love of God is also contagious. And those who are willing to walk into the dark places of this world, we can spread God's love as well. What does that mean for us, for a church in specific ways? I think it means in places like your ABF, it means places like in the choir. It means places anywhere where we gather as God's people. Let's just be honest, big church, that's what we called it when I was a kid. Big church is not always the best place to do this, right? We got a lot of people in here. It's not always conducive for us to just stand up in this, this place and, and share heartaches. We, if we did that one, we'd, we'd never get out of here, right? Uh, one of, not my favorite, but a meaningful phrase for me that I've heard from other preachers is every Sunday, there is a broken heart in every pew. Did you hear that? Every Sunday, in every fruit, there is a broken heart. But we want a place where people can lay their broken hearts open to us and say, this is where I'm hurting, this is where I'm broken, this is where I'm ill, so that we can speak the love of God into their lives. But it has to happen really in smaller groups, doesn't it? It has to happen in our ABFs, it has to happen in our small group Bible studies. Let's be a place where people can come and share their heartaches so that we can share within the love of God. It means you're gonna to have to be okay with some discomfort. It means you're gonna to have to be okay with the fact that we admit on a daily basis we live in a broken world. I think one of the reasons we try to keep this as at bay is because we think if we can pretend like the world isn't broken, everything will be okay. How's that working for you? We do live in a broken world and it causes us deep grief, but we do not grieve as those who have no hope. For we have a Savior who is willing to walk right in the middle of our hurting. And friends, if we will be that kind of place, a place where the hurting can come and share their heartaches, guess who will meet right there with us? We'll meet our Lord. He'll meet us in these small groups where we love one another in his name. And we will have great testimonies like Levi. I used to be a tax collector. I used to be a trader. I used to be a scoundrel, but by God's grace, I'm now a disciple of Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the church's mission. I pray we'll be a church that lives our mission well. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we, we, all, we, we don't get out of this world uninjured. <laughs> the truth of the gospel is we're all broken by sin. <laughs> And so there's just not a, there's not a one of us who, who haven't experienced the ramifications of this disease that we call sin. Lord, we thank you that in our lives, there have been people who have welcomed to sin. They haven't been afraid to get close to our heartache. They haven't been afraid like you with Levi to, to walk and be affiliated with sinners. Lord, we pray that we would continue to live that mission in other people's lives that, Lord, we would risk our reputation, that we would risk kind of our ignorant sense of well-being 
in order to bring your good news to the people who are hurting most because we believe that's the very reason you came. So Lord, help it to be the very reason we exist as your church in this place. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.